we'd like to begin the divine service with the hymn number 228. Happy is the one. Happy is the one who in every step taken asks of the Lord counsel. He is never lost. The happiness in this world is like the foam of the sea. But the joy of heaven is given to us as a gift, eternally given by the Lord our God. Happy is the one who listens to the gentle voice of Jesus. He has peace and gratitude granted from above. The happiness of this world is like the foam of the sea, but the joy of heaven is granted to us as a gift eternally from the Lord our God. Happy is he who in life has made amends with God. He shall have a powerful shield and shall overcome all evil. The joy in this world is like the foam of the sea. And the one in heaven is given to us as a gift eternally given by God. Let us pray together. Beloved Father in heaven, we come before you to thank you that first of all we are alive and we are here in this dwelling place. We now need your blessing over the one who will speak to us, he who will share your message with us. And Lord, we need to be able to have your spirit so we can understand it. And we pray, Lord, that those who are leading our country may have a heart that will not touch your people. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick. We pray that those who are lifting their eyes towards you, asking for help, Lord, give them blessing either with health or the health of their soul and give them the help they need. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you do for us. And now we wish to hear your word. Please bless your servant. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Să vă fie seara și sufletul binecuvântate. Să ne atingă Dumnezeu viața și să ne umple cu cuvântul Său. Trăim într-o perioadă We live in a period of celebration or festivals. It seems like the holidays have all gathered together at the end of the week when after a year of so many problems it could try to make us happy. Do you think it's possible for this to happen? This is my question. Will these holidays bring that joy? Tonight's sermon made me think a little bit because I kept thinking what title I should give it. At one point I thought it would be good for me to entitle it A Happy Life. But then I said, No one will be interested in this topic because it's kind of a perpetual uh, cliché that we hear and no one ever reaches it. Then I said, perhaps it would be good for us to be to title this sermon In Search of the Festival. It seemed more appropriate because everyone is looking for some kind of celebration in their life. I thought a title more challenging such as unhappy festivals might be appropriate. What do you think? I want to tell you that you're going to find all of these titles embedded in tonight's sermon. Let's begin with ourselves. The problem, let's start and see what problem we have and then we're going to find a scriptural solution. A short biblical resolution to our issue. Do you remember October 31st? You don't remember? What happened on October 31st? Was it All Saints Day? Or was it the celebration of the dead? And the tradition begins with All Saints Day and then we end with the celebration of all the dead. All that is ugly, everything that's dead, that's strange, appears on those days. I drove uh, and I saw around and I saw 12 skeletons playing football in one yard. They were all there. And I want to tell you they're still up. The world is full of morbid thoughts. And we have called this a celebration. Is it a celebration or not, I want to ask. In the end, our celebrations speak a little bit about what's inside of us. They introduce us to the great paradox that's within us. We want something and we accomplish something else. I want to ask you, what was yesterday? Not today. What was yesterday? Thanksgiving, right? And what is today? Yeah, it's Friday, but what? It, it was Black Friday, right? What did we celebrate? Did we celebrate Thanksgiving or Black Friday? Someone says, both. Of course, we all say this. But I want to ask you, why did we feel the need for... Why did we feel the need to have a Black Friday associated to Thanksgiving? What, what connection? Think about the name. 
do you see a connection black and thanksgiving let's think if there's any connection between the 28th when we all were thankful we tried to get used to the fact that we ought to be grateful and a day after that we find ourselves uh, trying to fulfill our dissatisfaction with what we owe, own a day before we said thank you Lord for all things we need nothing else and then the next day we need to go buying things because it's Black Friday I don't know why we contradict ourselves in this manner this is my problem in fact in the end what are we celebrating gratitude or ingratitude Black Friday or Thanksgiving what are we celebrating this is one of the my preoccupations and I notice how on a social level never is a celebration left alone it's not left alone it's always united with its opposite a counter celebration automatically why I wonder in a short time we will prepare for Christmas right what does Christmas mean Etym etymologically at least Christ must what does this mean it means the mass of Christ it comes from ma from the Latin it is the even this the evening supper or the Eucharist in the Catholic the Catholic tradition the Eucharist Eucharist of Christ we have come closer and instead of Christmas we have called it now Xmas of course I'm told wait a minute it's not quite like you say that X is still a symbol of Christ because there were such writings that from 1551 it said that that when all things were very Chris, uh, Christian that X was being used to symbolize the cross of Jesus Christ or the H from from Christ the word Christ uh, maybe for me th what's important is the outcome when I'm dealing with Xmas Christ becomes an unknown right it's a result I don't know if it's it's sought for it it happens automatically but it is a problem of the modern uh, time it's a, it's a celebration without Christ it is a supper or a church service without Christ so once again I will not enter into debate regarding this situation but it seems very suggestive what's happening even on the level of the name of the holiday would you like to open the scriptures with me to Ecclesiastes there's a text of great wisdom that ought to be read in regards to our celebrations in other words all of our celebrations ought to keep track of this text who in truth can eat and rejoice without him it's a question you answer I ask the question again who 
can truly eat and rejoice without him. Who? The problem is that we are trying. The problem is that we are trying. We spoke another time and I brought this into discussion. The great summaries of today are paradoxical. The Hegelian thought is like this. Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. You know what we do? We allow things to be divided. And we allow evil on one side, good on one side. Thesis, antithesis. The great problem is in the third stage. What is the third stage? Synthesis. We separate them and we say, look, this is evil and this is good. And after we have gone for a long time like this, because it's the Bible thinking for us to separate evil from good, after that, in the modern age, it is said, what would happen if we bring them together? Evil was on one side, good was on the other, but the great wisdom comes from the moment in which you bring both of them together and accomplish the great synthesis, the, synthesis, the synthesis where the opposing things come together. What was impossible becomes possible. Evil and good are mixed together. Darkness and light, no problem. I remain amazed when, on the level of a celebration, we have exactly this experience. I'd like to remind you one more time, October 31st, what connection does a saint have with all the dead? What connection does a saint, who evidently, according to the scripture, is a candidate to eternal life, what connection does he have? with the world full of death, or the symbols of death, or the spirits of the dead, what connection could they have? The cult of the forefathers is accepted by civilization easily. But the problem is, in Christianity, and because of the scripture, the cult of our forefathers is identified with demonology. So then, I repeat, what connection does the saint have with the demon or the unholy one? What connection is there? I would like to ask you, if we are trying to mix all of them, in this final uh, synthesis of the last days. Why do we put them together? In other words, why do we put what is holy with that which is not holy? Why do we put the profane along with that which is holy? My question would be like this. If you bring what is holy in the same place with that which is profane and ordinary, what happens? Does the unholy become holy? Or is the holy profaned? Or does do they stay separate? Do they neutralize one another? How do you think things function? Let's see that this is an old problem, and it preoccupied the scriptures as well. If you open with me to the book of Haggai, so let's go back to the Old Testament, to the small prophets, in Haggai chapter 2, 
Verse 11. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, so it's holy, right? And with his skirt doth touch bread, or pottage, or wine, or oil, or any meat. I want to ask you up till now. The bread, pottage, wine, oil, are these bad or good? Notice, we would be tempted to say that they're neutral. But they're not evil in it by any means. But the question here is, shall these things still be holy? Will, they s will it be holy? And the priest answered, no. Why? Well, holiness is not contagious. Holiness is not contagious. Holiness is not contagious. It does not mean that if you touch a holy thing, you also will become holy. And it doesn't mean that if you touch a priest who at that time was dressed in holy garments, if you touch them, you would not naturally become holy. I have problems when today A little holy water is brought in the house and everybody believes or people believe that the whole house is now holy as if holiness is contagious here the scripture says that's not how holiness works it's not contagious that's the first point the second point Haggai then said if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these things shall it be unclean and the priest answered and said Yes, it shall be unclean. Oh, so uncleanliness is contagious. But I thought that if one was contagious, then the other one was also contagious. This is how we reach the conclusion that some things are neutral. If one is not contagious and the other isn't contagious, then there's a neutral s situation, right? But here the scripture says holiness is not contagious but but uncleanliness is contagious now please notice where there is no holiness uncleanliness results that is why it is not possible to have a neutral situation there is no, it's not possible to be neutral. If both were non-contagious, then you could have neutral, a neutral situation. But uncleanliness is contagious. Every free space or neutral space becomes contaminated immediately by uncleanliness. Do you remember? There is that parable of the Lord Jesus Christ with the clean home. The house is unclean, it's vandalized, it's full of unclean spirits and thieves, and someone throws everybody out at, some, at one point. And the house remains clean, with flour, with rugs. It's exceptional. How long does it remain clean? How long does it remi remain neutral and unoccupied? For how long? And the Lord Jesus Christ places us face to face with the idea of invasion. And he says, if it was cleansed, but the master did not come to take control of the house then 
what will follow is the invasion of evil because he who was a thief and vandalized the house prior will go and get yet seven more and will come with the whole team and the coming is terrible its final state is worse than the one at the beginning so once again why do we gather them together the holy with the unholy why do they, we put them together we have the impression that they can stand together we have the impression that there is a dialect which we have learned when we left the garden of eden at the gate we learned this dialect between good and evil the snake said bring them together you will know the good and evil why isn't it in, why isn't it enough to know just good why did we have to bring evil into the mix could we ne not be happy with just good the snake said no the element of progress is found in contradictions and you need evil to be able to progress and we believed the lie and since then we mix good and evil hoping to evolve hoping to grow for that's why our celebrations are from time to time with Christianity other times with paganism mixed together but all have lost sight of Christ why because of the fact that evil overwhelms good and is contagious this is the problem holiness is fragile and cleanliness is contagious when we invented this thing God talk to us let's read in Isaiah 1 the Israelites as a nation had started this experiment they were celebrating God in some of his their celebrations and in some they were not and so they were lame of both feet mixing good and evil together Isaiah chapter 1 here the word of the Lord verse 11 to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me saith the Lord I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts is there anything wrong with all these things these were part of the sacrifices that represented the Messiah they were part of that extraordinary perspective of the plan of salvation was there anything evil in doing these things no when you come to appear before me who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts these things were not meant to destroy or to tread down the courts of God they were meant to sanctify God's courts bring no more vain oblations incense is an abomination unto me the new moons and Sabbaths all these things are actually good even the Sabbath we recognize as being God's commandment alongside the ceremonial Sabbaths in the scriptures and in the end verse 13 ends I cannot see your assemblies for there is iniquity in them God cannot see these two mixed if you if you mix celebrations with sin with iniquity you are celebrating iniquity here's the problem your new moons and your appointed feast my soul hateth they are trouble unto me I'm weary to bear them 
When you spread forth your hands, I hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear, for your hands are full of blood. You cannot mix the two. We've tried it, and we keep trying it, but God says it doesn't work. Do you think we can be happy like this? And when I say, can we be happy like this, I re I'm referring to our society, which calls itself Christian, and perhaps we have something to learn from it. Can we be happy like this? And now, with your willingness, let us open God's word to Second Chronicles chapter 30. I love this celebration a lot. Hezekiah. From verse 6. Hezekiah sent runners with letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel. Hezekiah was in Judah and he sent met letters everywhere, even in Judah and the north in Jerusalem, saying that all who'd like to come to the celebration should come. And behold what was written in these letters. Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to you, the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. How beautiful. The idea is, if you want a celebration, turn back to the Lord, because he is the spring of every celebration. Turn back to him. For all of Christianity, for the entire church, in this moment, if we want happiness, joy, and celebration, satisfaction, the condition is simple. That is turned towards God. Be not like your fathers and like your brethren which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation as ye see. Do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord but yield yourselves unto the Lord. What does this mean? It means take God by the hand. Allow God to take your hand. Let us understand. Perhaps there are many things for us to forget, but don't forget this. Yield yourselves unto the Lord. This is the true celebration. When you put your hand in God's hands, when God will take you by the hand, life is extraordinary. Yield yourselves unto the Lord. Come to his, enter his sanctuary where he has sanctified forever and serve the Lord your God that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them and lead them captive. To whom does he say these words? It is an extraordinary thing if we could understand it. He says this to those who had been taken into captivity in the north. And he tells them, if you will go to the Lord, the Lord will create an exodus for you and bring you back home. The Lord did this for Judah later on. Judah went into Babylonian captivity and God brought them back. Here, the word of God tells us that if they would have turned back to God, the northern part, which was taken into Assyrian captivity, could have, them, could have been brought home as well. God had prepared an exodus for them as well, if they would have turned back to God. If there had been at least one amongst them, would have turned. If there had been a few, like the three young men, if there was someone amongst them who wanted to return back, they could have come back. Do you see how far away from the celebration we are? See? 
how much obedience. If we turn back to God, then there is celebration. For the Lord your God is merciful. He will not turn his face from you if you will turn back to him. There is no greater celebration than to be face to face with the Lord. So the post passed from city to city to the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulon, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. This is how we miss out on the celebration. Nevertheless, diverse of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Verse 14, when they all came to Jerusalem, they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem. And all the altars for incense took they away and cast them into the brook Kidron. They reformed regarding all these items that was combining Jehovah, the altars of Baal, Asherah, Chemosh, and all kinds of other gods. They had tried to put all of this together. And here they threw away sin which had invaded Jerusalem. Verse 15, Then they killed the Passover on the fourteenth day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were shamed and sanctified themselves and brought in burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. I will allow you to keep reading the details. What I like very much is starting with verse 20. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. Do you notice? Do you see where gladness comes from? Gladness comes from obedience to God, from the presence of God in our life. That's where gladness comes in and they praised the Lord singing with loud instruments unto the Lord the Levites were doing this verse 22 and Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord and they did they eat for seven days offering peace offerings and verse 23 and the whole assembly took counsel to keep another seven days this is unique in history. Lesson, when God gives you joy, when God helps you rejoice, you will desire for the celebration to no longer end. You will desire to keep going like this. You want seven days and you want seven days more. Can you not live a whole lifetime of celebration? This is the idea. You can Verse 26, if you would. So there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was none. I'm sorry, there was not the like in Jerusalem. Verse, so there was, one more time, so there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was none like it in Jerusalem. Then the priests and Levites arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. Brothers and sisters, if we want a celebration at the end of the year, this is what we must do. We must turn back to God. And then the joy comes from actual obedience to him. I would like to end with the same picture in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, Verse 
In verse 40 of this chapter, Paul says, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. What does this mean? It means to come out of this great synthesis where sin and righteousness, good and evil are mixed together. Save yourself from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Through the apostles, many mi miracles were done. All were together in one place. They sold their homes. They shared all that they had. I don't know if what this is, if you can't call it a celebration. They all together were one heart. They were together. They felt the same. They were in the temple every day. They broke the bread together and ate with joy. They were praising the Lord. They were very pleasant before the Lord. This was not a celebration from a week. This was a church. And please notice, the Church of Jesus Christ is an unending celebration. This is beautiful. For all those who have not enjoyed happiness too much, break the synthesis break down the compromise stand on God's side learn obedience obedience to him and turning back to him and your joy will be of such a nature in which you can say my cup is full and overfloweth amen I invite you to sing together for the glory of God a song of joy. If you love the Lord always, you shall be happy on your road. If you love the Lord all the time, happy will you be upon your road. over mountains, over valleys, through storms, and through fiery storms. He shall gently carry you. Pray at every step. May his book be your holy place of rest. The Lord for his children is preparing joys, faithful in him if they've remained. The Lord is preparing for his children many joys if they have remained faithful in him. If the world is against you, do not be discouraged. This is his path. You walk down his path. You belong to him. You walk down the road with him. You are not abandoned. Through faith, you can now sing. Our Father, in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you.
to ask you, Lord, to please receive our outstretched hand toward you. Take us, Father, by the hand and help us take you by the hand so that joy will never end again, so that the celebration may be every day more and more fresh every day, and that the Passover may never end, that the celebration of joy will be permanent in our life. Help us not to need the joy of the world, which through definition is infected with contradictions of good, of holiness, and of salvation. We want to have your joy from the Holy Spirit, dear Lord. We want him to bear forth his joy in our life so that in this way we may not desire the joy that is outwardly received but have the joy that comes within. Make us your church. Make us happy for your temple. Happy for your church. Happy for your word. Happy that we can praise you and that we have begun to celebrate eternity from here. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. While the sound is off here in the translation booth, I just want to thank each and every one of our English-speaking guests for being a part of our church family. God bless you, and may he keep you faithful to him, and may he fill your life with his joy. God bless you. Please be a part of our church family whenever you're in our area.